Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dean's Chat, where we discuss all things podiatric medicine. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Jensen. I'm the Dean at the Arizona College of Podiatric Medicine and the host for the Dean's Chat podcast. We are so lucky today. Dr. Larry Harkless is joining me for his third episode. In the first episode, we discussed uh, Dr. Harkless's beginnings, if you will, uh, up through going to the California College of Podiatric Medicine and residency opportunities and and getting to San, uh, San Antonio. In the second episode, we discussed the San Antonio days where so many students and residents had the opportunity to train with Dr. Harkless. And I thought today, um, as our um, third episode, we would talk about Dr. Dr. Harkless's experience in the educational realm of our profession. Um, as many of you know, Dr. Harkless was the founding dean for the Western University College of Podiatric Medicine in California, and he also is the founding dean of the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley School of Podiatric Medicine in uh, the Rio Grande Valley in Harlingen, Texas. So Larry, after all those years of teaching residents and fellows and having students come through the clinic as clerks, um, how did you decide to get involved in starting a new college of podiatric medicine? Well, I think I mentioned at the beginning uh, of the discussion about my background and college and the California College of Podiatric Medicine. I uh, had, there was nothing on my radar to say that I would be a dean of a, a college of podiatric medicine. <laughs> I had never even thought about it. However, um, on the 30th of June in 06, uh, I got demoted uh, as a full professor with tenure and reassigned to clinical duties. And there was a lot of politics related to uh, the program and my involvement with the scope of practice issues with ankle fractures where I was an expert witness in the district court. And I won't get into all of that, but in October of 05, I received a call from a guy named Ben Cohen, and he had, was the founding dean, I believe, of the first state osteopathic medical school in Texas. And it was from uh, my alma mater, which was North Texas State. So um, I met him when I served on a special medical advisory group that advises secretary of the VA. And uh, I was uh, trying to influence him in considering having a podiatry school at UNT. The enabling legislation that Dr. Bogey passed in 1973 was for the University of Texas system, not the North Texas State University system. And so we had engaged in meaningful conversation during the time I was on the SMAG committee with him. Uh, he was representing the osteopathic profession and I was representing uh, podiatric medicine. So he had actually retired and moved to Boca Raton. And uh, the president of, of uh, Western, uh, Dr. Pomerantz, had talked him out of retirement to move to California to help him grow the Western University's health sciences complex. And even prior to him moving there, uh, there had been discussion at Western about adding a college of podiatric medicine. So he actually moved there to uh, add three colleges, podiatric medicine, dental medicine, and optometry. Uh, 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 optometry. Mm -hmm. So he called me in October 05 and asked me what I uh, consider as a consultant to help him be the dean, uh, help him start the school, but more importantly, what I seriously consider being the dean. <laughs> so I told him I would help him, but I didn't know that I really wanted to, to be the dean. And so I, I did. I started some things and I a couple of trips there. And then the issue that I mentioned uh, happened and it was clear that it was time for me to uh, to move on. And I probably would have never uh, left UT had had all that other those other things had not happened. And so uh, so I decided in, uh, I think it was uh, 06, um, probably October, November, that I would seriously uh, consider going to, to join him there. And I did. So I started there in uh, July 1 of 2007. And so that was not uh, something, as I said, I was planning to be a, a dean. Although in terms of learn, serve, lead, through service in the university, even at the Health Science Center in San Antonio, I actually chaired the medical faculty assembly there. And I was really engaged in uh, the life and breath intramurally within the university as it relates to uh, the, you know, just education, service, all of those particular aspects. So um, I served on a lot of different committees. I actually served on about six or seven uh, 
searches for chairs of department and all of that. So uh, I learned that uh, when I was part time, I was clinical and I could not uh, you couldn't participate on those uh, committees if you weren't full time. And so that's when I really just started learning so much more about everything. Not that I didn't know a lot uh, at that particular point. The, also, Dr. Heckman, the chairman of orthopedics, uh, oftentimes when he was out of town or busy, I represented the department at the chair's meeting at the medical school. And so I probably did that, I don't know, six, eight times. And so even just doing that in his stead, I, again, got to see kind of how things worked uh, from a major medical school perspective. So I really wasn't scared to uh, start a school, although uh, it was uh, it was basically new. And so uh, being uh, knowing him as well as I did, uh, he was serious about it. And so I figured that he would be a great mentor, and he was. But more importantly, uh, they had five uh, colleges there before they added the, the three new colleges. And so I figured that I could talk to all the deans there and say, what do I need to do to be the dean and take my little pen and paper and learn and grow. And that's basically what what uh, what happened. Uh, I um, I had some own, uh, some strong feelings about what I felt the schools uh, weren't were not doing and the issues that I had as a program director when, when I would get a, a student that, to start July 1 of, in, the, uh, in the internship year, if you will. And uh, my biggest concerns was I thought that we weren't as strong medically as we needed to be because it would oftentimes take me three or four months to get the residents uh, where they should have been on July 1 because historically we would oftentimes get students from all the schools of podiatric medicine and it was not just saying this one was better or that one was better. But I thought that all uh, uh, there was significant amount of improvement needed to take place. And I thought that we really suffered most from medicine and that the surgery or it was all about the surgical numbers. You spent more time doing that, et cetera. And so uh, the, the biggest concern I had was uh, how could I assure that students uh, would have uh, excellent information gathering and presentation skills by the time they started that third year. And so uh, when I, uh, and also I had conference, I think I mentioned that uh, about UT, that we had conference every week. And that's why we how we held everybody accountable for one word, uh, learning and every level of learning, learning would uh, would be there. So I felt that if I could establish that, that that would be important. And uh, but I needed residents. I needed if I was starting as students, as students, then I need to have residents and fellows to to have the the the, the continuum of all, of all of that under one umbrella. And so I was. Uh, it was important that I started. Um, to try to start a residency, and that was a major piece that the CPME, the all credit body, required, was that we needed to develop residency programs. And that was my strong suit because that's where I had served all of my career. And so I thought that would have been fairly easy to do in uh, in California, being a bigger state, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, uh, that was a, the, the most difficult part because there wasn't money to do that. And then uh, more importantly, it was difficult to get individuals who were really interested in education to, to want to do that on a full-time basis, uh, et cetera. So uh, I met with the chancellor for UC Irvine, and he recommended that I go to uh, the county hospital in Riverside and San Bernardino. Western already had a phenomenal relationship with uh, San Bernardino County, which is called Arrowhead. So the chairman of surgery at Western was the uh, head of wound care at the he was head of general surgery and wound care at the, the county hospital. And so I immediately uh, met him. And I, uh, as the dean, I went out and started a clinic, which they did not have there at the county hospital in uh, uh, San Bernardino. And I also went to uh, Riverside. So t so to me, the uh, you really needed a clinic. And that's where I came from, in a county hospital setting. And then I would, was hopeful that I could start residencies there. And then a lot of times uh, the private guys would jump to having a fellow. So they don't really start off with the students, residents, fellows, and all of it, but I kind of wanted to tie that in to Western. And I immediately found out that the osteopathic profession historically is in the education business, not the clinical business. And so I was pioneering, now they were rotating there, and maybe one or two faculty may have been there doing stuff, but that wasn't where, like the traditional medical school where you had full-time faculty there in the county hospital and the VA teaching every day that's holding everybody accountable uh, for, for that one word learning at every level.
Yeah. So, so that that's kind of uh, what happened, and I, I uh, never planned that again that I wanted to to be a uh, a dean. And so, um, uh, although uh, I won the teaching awards and the education piece. Uh, that's not the same as, you know, administration, leadership, but everything up until that point in my career was really all about leadership. I, I chaired the uh, well, hospital privileges. We had to go to the state, uh, go to the legislature and amend the Health License Act in 85. That's when I was president-elect of our state society. And uh, uh, along with do- uh, Dr. Bogey and Dr. Leonard Levy was a part of all of that because he performed the initial feasibility study in 77, 78 for the School of Podiatric Medicine. And, and as I mentioned earlier, he was my uh, my mentor and interviewed me to go into podiatric medical school. So I felt that uh, uh, he would mentor me as well. And so after I, uh, early after I uh, moved to California, I think I went to uh, Fort Lauderdale. He was at uh, Nova Southeastern at the time, over research, and he was a professor there. Spent about three days with him and said, hey, what I, what I need to do to be the dean? So I, he was a, a great mentor. So I spent time with Leonard. And... Uh, Chet Evans was the dean at Barry, and at the ACFES meeting, and it must have been in 07, February 07, he pulled me aside and kind of gave me some pointers on being the being dean as well. And then Jeff, uh, um, the, the, the dean at uh, Midwestern. Dr. Page. Doc, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Page also, uh, I, I had a great relationship with him because he had been the dean up at uh, CCPM. And so in 1995, we created a, a rotation where uh, we would take about five or six students who would spend the entire fourth year with us at the university where they could rotate on medicine and all of that. And so uh, leader, Dr. Levy had that vision, but but he was the one that implemented that. And that was a great, uh, great opportunity. So we knew each other quite well. From from you know way way back there, and then he was a basketball player and in, involved in sports. So I think one or two years at ACFES, it was in Las Vegas. It may have been the, the super seminar that California had. Uh, we went to a couple of basketball games together at UNLV. <laughs> so 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 we knew each other quite well through uh, through all of that. But that was the uh, that's kind of how I ended up in that in uh, as, as the dean. And um, I had never been a dean also, but I. Uh, uh, Gene Washington was my roommate, but he was the uh, vice chancellor at uh, UC San Francisco. And then I mentioned that the dean at uh, Irvine was Michael Drake. So I knew them from school. And so I called each one of them up to ask them about being a dean again before I moved to California. Just getting just inside perspective on, you know, salary and just, you know, kind of what the job would be. And uh, they were very, very helpful. And and uh, mentoring me also. And so they, they they were very helpful because they've always been in higher education on the MD side, if that makes sense. So I had Dr. Korn, who was one of the uh, preeminent leaders in osteopathic medicine, and he's been revered. He's, he's passed away since, but just a phenomenal uh, guy, a phenomenal leader. Right? Uh, and he really, uh, really pushed me a lot and taught me a lot about the history of the osteopathic profession. And then through Gene and, and being at the Health Science Center, I knew a lot about the MD profession. And then there we were, you know, trying to integrate. And we started three schools simultaneously, a dental school, optometry, oh. and uh, podiatric medicine. So there were three uh, founding deans that started at the same time. And so we uh, shared a lot about each profession, helped each other. It wasn't like you were there by yourself. And I was impressed with the interprofessional education piece that the vision that Dr. Pomerantz and Dr. Cohen had uh, for the profession. And that's when that, that, that was kind of the buzzword early on in that, at that time. And we even had a meeting where the head of education for UCLA's medical school facilitated a, a, um, a workshop, if you will, a retreat, if you will, on just interprofessional education for the existing deans and the new deans, even before I uh, actually uh, came on board in 07. We had a had a big retreat, yeah. So, so Weston was one of the pioneers of that in the uh, not only osteopathic profession, but just in medicine in general. Uh, Sherry Aston, who was at Temple, came as the um, she was the assistant provost under Cohen, and she was an optometrist. And then she worked in at the podiatry school there in Temple for years. So, uh, so she brought two professions with her, optometry and podiatry, in addition to the skill set she had. To uh, to be the leader and integrate that within the system, and so she was the one that was responsible for 
developing the interprofessional education program or, uh, or with one of the DO uh, uh, for physicians as well. Yeah, that's interesting. And that, and that was signature then, and the, the, that was a big grant through HHS. That's when Obamacare was first coming in. They came up with the PCORI and, I, and several other things. But the interprofessional piece it was a big grant, but the University of Minnesota was the uh, the university that received that grant. And uh, uh, Sherry worked very, very closely with them, and they were on the program and leadership lecturing and doing a lot of things on a national basis and international as it related to uh, IPE. So uh, uh, we, uh, it was a required course for every class, every uh, of those uh, uh, nine colleges at Western in the first two years. And uh, you had a uh, case you worked through. They had a, a, a the case-based learning session, you had a, a participant from each a discipline, from PTOT, from everybody, and that was a case, and yeah. it was just amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I facilitated for three years, so I, I, I learned as much and not more than they did, you know, just from the process, yeah, as, although I was, you know, facilitating. Right. Um, you know, it's not surprising that Dr. Page was helping you out. I know Dr. Yoho and Dr. Page helped me a ton when I was yeah. a new dean. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Yoho, just a sidebar, Dr. Yoho and Dr. Page said, well, there's one thing for sure. You can never make everybody happy as the dean. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's true. No, no, that's true. And that's then right. the, the other thing, um, Dr. Well, I, I, I learned from, uh, well, my, uh, my family's in education. So my brother was a principal and all of that. And uh, he taught, told me about how uh, Mr. J.C. Begworth, I may have mentioned him in the initial of my uh, high school and growing up, but uh, he said, uh, "Be uh, be good to your friends. Don't make fight your enemies and make your enemies your friends." And so, the people that would be against you, you need to really just sit down and listen to them, because there are some things that you can work together on to minimize that 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 pushback, if you will. Absolutely. And that was helpful. And and it's all about the dollar bill. And, you know, everybody wants something and trying to negotiate that. And I think that's why you need a strategic plan and you bring everybody in on the strategic plan. And there's always going to be something in there for everybody. And you give people opportunity to lead, uh, to learn, serve, lead within that plan. And then that's something that they're responsible for. So they can't complain about, you know, everything. There's something that you that they can do to lead in a, in a, in a right way. You know, and I think I, that I think that's interesting because some of the best advice I ever got was a budget is nothing more than a numerical representation of a strategic plan. They got to go hand in hand. I totally agree, but that's how you hold them accountable. That's the best part about the CPME is the fact that uh, you know you got to have a budget to support what they require you to do. And so I always I, I love the CPME coming because I said they only coming for one reason to make me better at yeah. what I'm doing. Absolutely. And, 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 that, and that was it. <laughs> so what was it like? You know, I think it's great. Um, you were, the, at the time, you were the third school that was completely integrating the basic sciences with the DO program, right? Right. Uh-huh. What was it like recruiting your first class? Well, that was the hardest part because they would not let me participate in the uh, uh, AACPM. So we weren't part of the the national uh, CRIP. You I weren't? Mean, the, uh, no. the application process? No, not the first year. Oh, you're kidding me. Well, how'd you yeah. get students? How did you end up uh, recruiting I, I, students? I, I, I was a football coach. I went out and recruited on my own. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> no, 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 I'm serious. Yeah. Like, like Nick Saban. Right. Basically, uh, we went to the council and they took the lawyer. I thought they was going to sue their CPME. But that, you know, that didn't happen. But they, uh, you couldn't be a part of the, the uh, AACPM unless you had candidate status okay. and you can't get candidate status, you know, until, you know, you go through all those processes. And so that's wrong. That meant that they didn't want the profession to grow. You should welcome new people. I so mean, what, if I, why, why would you be scared for, to bring some open people in? I mean, I didn't understand that. I, I, right. I was totally, I uh, didn't understand at all. I didn't even know that happened. What year was that Larry? What year did you bring your first class in? I brought the first class in and the, uh, in August of uh, 2009. Okay. All right. Very good. August, so you, August. you had a, you basically had a little time though, right? You had to bring in faculty, podiatric faculty, because you already had the basic science faculty, right? Right. Right. Well, let's see. We had to, we had to submit the eligibility application 
September 1 of 07. And I started July 1. So I had about two months oh, to man. put that put that together and, and, and send that in. And so we we did that and we got approved to do that. And uh, we had to do a self-study. And and then, uh, you know, to get candidate status. Sure. Right. So. Um, and 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 then you had to have a class in place before they would come to visit, if that makes sense, in terms of the rules that they had. So we pre- we presented before the CPME and the AACP. As a matter of fact, I think they had the meeting in Hawaii and Ben went over there and presented as well. He and I and the lawyer. Wow. Yeah. So so. Uh, but uh, that's you a, know, that, that, that's a daunting task to put the whole curriculum together and all the lectures and all the tracks of surgery and biomechanics and pod med. And I mean, I, I my well, hat's off to you, Larry. That's a, that's, well, that's well, a lot. Well, uh, when, when I decided to do that, uh, I, I had no experience in curriculum or even just the students in just doing that. I mean, I, we, I knew the residency curriculum and I, and it's a, it's a, the student curriculum in school is a continuation even through residency, but but I had no experience. But that's why I ended up hiring Lester Jones, okay. because Lester had been at the, uh, he was my classmate, but he was also at CCPM for all his career, basically. Right. And he had been on, uh, he had been the vice chair of CPME. And so uh, I talked to Barry Block and and uh, a couple of people and, and uh, the boss. Before, I mean, I knew that and I was thinking that, but everybody I talked to said, you need to get Lester <laughs> to, to join you. And I didn't know we were classmates, but uh, I had already been thinking that. And he agreed to doing that. But he was the associate chief of staff for quality for the Great Los Angeles VA. Okay. And he was the chief of uh, surgery there. He, he replaced uh, Dave Jacobson. Uh, they were... Uh, was losing accreditation. And so by them being part of uh, UCLA, the VA, the uh, vice chairman of surgery at UCLA was the chief of surgery at the VA uh, in Livingston. And so uh, he was going to run the program himself, but they told him that it had to be a podiatrist, that he couldn't do that. And I think they gave him Lester's name and a couple other people's name. And so uh, he uh, invited Lester to come up to San Francisco, to L.A., the interview and uh, and Lester told him that he would come if he treat him like any other discipline in medicine. He didn't want to be treated any dis- different from anybody else. If he give him the opportunity to learn, serve, lead, do all the things that he wanted to do, and he said, "You got it." And so Lester uh, moved, uh, moved to uh, down to LA and everything. Else. And then after serving, he became the, the associate chief of staff for quality. And that's when the UCLA VA got on probation through the VA. Related to the research enterprise, if you will. I remember. Yeah. That. So Lester worked worked through all of that, and he was an amazing guy in terms of his experience. And then while he was at UCLA, uh, one of the general surgeons said, well, "We need." Uh, that was uh, working at Olive View UCLA the County out in um, San Fernando Valley. Told him to that they uh, they needed podiatry like they were doing it at the VA there. And so that's when Lester started going there, and that's when Doctor Axon Nuvong was his chief resident. So they were the ones that was going out there early on until right. they really got the, the, the running. And and that's when he would call me all the time to find out what I was doing in the county system in San Antonio. So oh, so we would, he would call me almost like six o'clock, at least once a week. Cause he, now he, that's one of the hardest working guys I know. Jones, that, that boy can work. I mean, I, I'm work hard, but he, <laughs> I'm, I'm still not in his league. I don't think, but, uh, uh, but that was the, the relationship. So the, the biggest concern I had for starting the school was the clinical rotations. How could I assure, as I was, uh, I raised that question earlier that we had great rotations, you know, in the third and fourth year. And I wanted the students to rotate on the medicine and surgery in the third year not the fourth year. I wanted them to be just like a medical student in that, uh, to do uh, at least six months uh, in that third year. And so by taking all the classes with the medical school, then we had that foundation, not some of them, all of them, then we could do that. And that's what we were able to accomplish. Uh, the dean of the medical school, uh, he was a retired admiral, uh, Dr. Adams, and Ben Cohen supported that as well. And so that really... And they was trying to integrate everything where it was all the interprofessional education at a level that I had never seen. Wow. Yeah, it wasn't like, because what happens in medical schools, because the curriculum is so tight, 
Nobody's willing to give up anything to do anything different, whether, whether it's nursing, PT, or that. They'll do a little something on the side, but it's not the full integration that that we were able to obtain at Western uh, in that regard. And so uh, so that was good. Uh, Dwight Stevens, uh, we had about four or five podiatrists that participated in IPE that facilitated uh, throughout the, the life and breadth of the course, in addition to some of our faculty. Sometimes our faculty, in terms of clinical and all that, would get busy. But we always had about five or six podiatrists facilitating uh, in those groups. And the other issue was, uh, which I did in San Antonio, but I did even more at Western, was to lecture to every discipline at the Health Science Center that had anything on the foot and ankle. Sure. And that's what we don't do. And so uh, if you start doing that, then you control your destiny because you're educating at the root level. Absolutely. Yeah. If you do it that, then everybody knows. And so I still think that that's the biggest opportunity we have in our profession is to go to all the medical schools and start teaching. And I I, I think the people that do that should do it and not get paid. I mean, I, that's hard to say, but you start. And if you're good at it, then they, they'll start paying you. You know, right. they'll, they'll see they'll see the value in it. That's the key, because they think they know everything and that they're covering everything. And they don't know what they don't know until we are we are there, and integrating in that with with some passion and uh, and energy, uh, in the, in that regard. That's yeah. so true. That's so true. Auto can't auto can't do what we do, because uh, they don't. They, they, there's a different. We have a different DNA than they do, they, and they don't know that. <laughs> Education's everything, isn't it? That's that's exactly right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And let me say one thing. I think I talked about that a little bit, and I won the teaching teaching award and all of that. But um, I mean, that was just the interest in me for learning and and uh, making sure that they know. And it's just like a good coach. I mean, you're gonna uh, make sure that the the students get the the, right, the appropriate fundamentals. And so, without having the uh, standardized patients, which we have today, and, and remediation, if you will. That's why I had my conference, because the two cases we prevented, uh, the guy, somebody would get up and say, Miss so is a 49 year old uh, female, said she had a painful uh, right great toe. And so I called on somebody, well, they got to go ask the questions to get the information from him. And he didn't just tell you everything. So that's how I could tell whether they knew how to do that well. And more importantly, we had clinic too. So it didn't take me a couple of days in clinic. I could pretty much have a person where they needed to be because we had, you know, 40, 50 patients a day in the clinic. And the average student would see six or seven himself every day. Absolutely. And they had to get the information and present. And so that creates that process. And that's what we miss from the podiatry schools. And I think that um, the podiatry schools are still solo. They want to do everything on their own. And they don't reach out because I still think that you know, if we work together, that you have enough county hospital systems where you can put all that stuff in place, et cetera, where you can assure that they have those basic skills solidly. If that makes sense. You know, nope, yeah, that's, that's a, a that's a challenge. We spend time on the surgery and a student think it's all about that. But if they get that other foundation right, everything else is easy. And that's what makes them that great clinician, even in today's system, because the health systems today, I still believe in that they uh, value us for our comprehensiveness, not necessarily just the surgery. Oh, I agree with you. How long yeah. were you? How long were you at Western, Larry? Uh, I was there ten years, okay. and I almost got a divorce. Uh, not really, but um, I told my wife we'd be there after about five or six. Graduate a couple of classes, and we come back to Texas. And I think after about eight and a half, almost nine years, she said, "You'd like to be here about almost nine years." She said, "I'm going home. You can." Stay here long as you want to. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, yeah, I remember when you well, were well, you were chairing AA after you'd already left Western, right? Right. That, yeah, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was a success. And then you went back home to Texas. How did the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley opportunity present itself? Well, uh, let's see. I, I returned here in late September, early October of uh, 17. Okay. And I think in December of 17, Caparuso called me up and told me that he was going to these meetings that they were considering having a School of Podiatric Medicine at UTRGV. And I remember when I was in California that I read that the uh, UT system had opened two new medical schools while I was in California, uh, the Dale in Austin and UTRGV in 
the legislature approved those in the 2015 session, and those uh, each school opened uh, uh, matriculated their inaugural classes in six, yeah, 16 in uh, August of July, August of 16, and they graduated in in 20. Yeah, so he mentioned that to me, and they were doing what they call uh, feasibility for the uh, is a planning authority agreement that you have to fill out for the UT system, right. and then they'll look at that from that planning, and then they could do that. But the university had decided that they would, uh, would one of the podiatry school, they were looking at dentistry and optometry, but they uh, decided that podiatry was the most important because of diabetes, amputation, just all that, and what the Valley really, really needed in terms of healthcare. And so that's kind of how that evolved. Initially, they were looking at optometry and dentistry, and, and Jack Krause came from Temple to be the dean in June of 17. And and he after I was there, he told me that uh, he was the one that had to told him that they needed podiatry, not optometry and dentistry. And so that's how that evolved. And and Doctor, I always said to myself that we only need one person in the right position that understood our value and could really make a major decision for us to get to school. And that's basically what happened. He told the president that and had some data to show him for what the needs were in the valley and Texas as a whole. And uh, that, that's what happened. And the president uh, uh, agreed, Dr. Bailey. And he had uh, been in higher education in Texas. He was the provost here at UTSA oh. and, and uh, for from 97 to about 05. And then he left that position and became the president of Texas Tech in, in Lubbock. And then he left there and was at the University of Alabama as he had for about a year and a half or so. I think he, his wife passed away. And then that's when he... Uh, moved back to Texas to take over UTRGV. And so he's been there since uh, 14. So he was the one that took UT Brownsville and Pan American and amalgamated them under under one yeah, in that regard. So so um, when I got back, I was retired and I was well, probably about like six or nine months, but I started working for the state association one day a week in Austin to increase residency positions in the state within the major academic health centers. Okay. And so I put together a plan to, and I think I asked for $2 million to them of residencies uh, at UT Southwestern, where Lavery and uh, Michael Van Pelt and Ty Lu are. Okay. And uh, Texas Tech, I was looking at the regional campus in Millen, Odessa, and UTRGV, and, and to expand some positions in San Antonio. And so that was going to end up in about probably about 16, 18 uh, positions wow. and for, for, for about for about, about two million. So I presented, uh, made a presentation to the higher education subcommittee in the House of Representatives. That was in the 19, the 19 session. Right. Yeah, let's see. 17, yeah, it was 19, right. Mm -hmm. That was a uh, run from second Tuesday in January to the end of May, about five months. That's a and, and they do a, a two-year budget, a biennial budget, when they do a budget for Texas, uh -huh, right? So um, uh, that's where I uh, found out that to start a program uh, that Texas was spending $150 million on graduate medical education, the state was. And so uh, uh, all this chancellors and the head of the, of the major universities was presenting when I presented that day. So I was kind of at the end. So I was there pretty much all day. So uh, I went up and introduced myself to the Higher Education Coordinating Board, and that, and I met him, and then I met some of the people under him, and they told me that Stacy Silverman ran the, the uh, graduate medical education part. So I called her after that meeting the next day, and she explained all that to me, that uh, we couldn't participate unless we amended the education code, because the code said MD and DO, not, and DPM wasn't involved. Okay. And so I by learning that then, when I went to count to to the Valley, I knew the importance of residences as relate to CPME. And so I told the president that uh, if they wanted a school, that they had, we had to amend the, the uh, GME code to do that so that we could increase residences in the state. And we got a lot of pushback even, even from that. But the fact that the university had approved it uh, for the school and the regions had approved it, they called the, the, the schools off. You know, So we had 14 state medical schools, uh, 17 in the state, 14 state supported. And uh, uh, they said, but we need podiatrists like we need, you know, primary care and everybody else. How are we going to keep Texas walking? So it was very, very interesting. And by that time, we had, had hired a lobby group, uh, what TPMA did. And so that even made it a whole lot uh, easier and better because you had somebody there every day 
you know, work in the system, right. you know, if you will. And they would tell us uh, what TMA was doing, how they was trying to say this. And they tried to act like everything is scope of practice, et cetera. But it was really all about education. I think that's the ticket for us in the future to integrate. And I really think that we need a National Academy of Medicine to study us so that they say that so that we can integrate and we can do that interprofessionally. So uh, we are incapable of understanding that. I don't know, uh, because the schools are siloed and, and everybody, and I'm not anti any of that, but I really believe that uh, if we do that, that uh, everybody will know more about us and we can do more in the system, if that makes sense. I think our degree should remain the same. I don't know it's about degree. Right. Uh, yeah. it's, about, it's about integration uh, uh, with, with Madison. And I think there's room for you to teach and do stuff within that process. Sure. Larry, let me yeah. ask you about that bill that inc included podiatry into the residency training. It has a huge bill. It's monumental for the profession. What do you see long-term? When's that going to come to fruition? Are, are they talking about, currently as we speak, increasing the residency positions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, 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 the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board provides the administration and governance of the of the money, of the, the, the money that the legislature appropriates, you yep. know, for GME, right? Yep. Yep. And so, for example, Texas Tech gets more of that money than anybody. They probably get 40, 50 million okay. because it's, they got all those rural counties out there in West Texas. They have two medical schools, El Paso and Lubbock. And so uh, to provide service to all those areas and send more doctors out there, you, you can see why that's so important. And so... Um, so I believe that you need four residents at each at each medical school, four for three years, okay. and one full time faculty that's paid for by the state, not by a hospital. Right. They, if they invested in that, they need to pay our faculty full time. So you're to, talking to that. four positions per year at fourteen medical centers. You're talking what no, no, fifty six positions? Yeah. Well, well, initially. Okay. Well, we have to do the UT system, okay. and you have to have, you have the system help you open up because orthopedics gonna always be in the door keeping you out. That would never change. That's Jim Crow as related to civil rights and stuff. A lot of that's that would never change, but they don't control it. Right. The patients need us. We need the training, and everybody needs to be trained better on the foot and ankle. So how are you going to have that if you don't have podiatry doing that? Like we have a UT for, for those many, many years. Yeah, that makes if sense. If that makes sense. Yeah, totally yeah, makes yeah. sense. That's huge. Yeah. That's huge opportunity, Larry. Right. But you got to get the system where the, the leader, maybe the chairman of the UT system, regents or whoever, call, tell the people that that needs to happen and blah, 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 blah. Right, right. So, so that means that the president should... Well, the, it should start with the deans of the medical schools where the, ed, that, where the edict comes down from the top, saying, calling them and saying, hey, uh, you know, we got a podiatry school and we need podiatry programs and I want you to consider uh, how we can integrate that and make that happen. Right Now, he, he ain't doing that, but he's subliminally planting the seed for this is what we'd like to see in the system. Hey, nothing, yeah. nothing happens overnight, Larry. It'll happen. Yeah. You got yeah, you know, to get a foot in the door, right? But we have people, for us, for example, uh, I still think that training the right people that want to do that on a full-time basis is the key. You're right. And, 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 and doing it at the level of, of just not podiatry, but educating everybody in the system. I mean, to me, and that should be part of the strategic plan, the big picture. And then you can include the private guys in town that want to be educators and teach. Absolutely. And there, are a lot, there are a lot of those guys. Yeah, yeah, to, 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 you know, that can, can help you do that at, at the biggest level. And so to me, that will allow them to get clinical appointments at, all, at, you know, all over the state, man. And that's what that means over time. And every program in the state that's existing now could be better by rotating their residents through there and, and cross-pollination uh, and fertilization that you will in that uh, in that process. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that, yeah. that's brilliant, Larry. So, so, so um uh, Texas Tech is ready. Uh, at uh, Tara Deaver is at the regional campus in in the middle of Odessa. Okay. So I actually gave grand rounds there in 2018, and so they are ready. And then you have Abilene, they have family medicine, and they have a rural 
a rural uh, a division of that. And so, uh, so that's an area where if you if you can have some podiatrists out there to participate, that's just enormous amount of dollars from HRSA, Health Resource and Service Administration, HHS, uh, to town to the primary care. I mean, it's interesting, but see, the valley was not new to me, nor podiatry, even though we ended up with the school there. They wanted a medical school back in the 40s and 50s. Right. The po politics pushed them hard enough that they created a regional campus in the valley, in, in Harlingen, and probably around about 92, 93. Wow. So podiatry was the first program in 96 to have interns in the Valley. So all my interns from 96 to 2005 spent two months in the Valley. Interesting. Yeah. And so, 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 so I knew everybody through the regional campus. So they built what a, what a podiatric medical school is now. That was the regional campus. Right. And they had a, a MD, a MPH named Lionel Vella, I think in 99, to uh, be the regional dean. And he came from Texas Tech, but he got his, uh, I think he had gone to Harvard or maybe got his master's at Harvard, whatever, but he's a, a brilliant guy. And then we had Sue Clinica, and that's where Caparuso had gone, and he trained with me. So he ran that aspect for us in the Valley. Gotcha. And so at, we were at Valley Baptist in Brownsville and Harlan, and, uh, Harlingen and Brownsville, and then we had Sue Clinica. And Sue Clinica was just like the county hospital. They were seeing about 6,000 patient visits for dietary just in Sue Clinica. Right. And that was that's it. They had the largest federally qualified health center in America right there. Yeah. And so uh, that's still in place today. Right. And then you have the Brownsville Community Health Center, federally qualified center. And then you have a new extra or something in Hidalgo County, which is McAllen. And that's the biggest county. So uh, they're getting ready to work with them now for quotations for students. And so that you go, you ain't got anything you read in the book, go walk in the clinic. <laughs> no, that, that makes sense. You know, some Larry, just a sidebar. Um, I, I was kind of surprised they put the school at the Rio Grande Valley site. I thought they would, if they started a podiatry school, I figured Texas would put it at UT San Antonio. Well, that's where Dr. Bogey wanted the school <laughs> and everybody knew that. Okay. Uh, in the 1995 session, uh, Bob Bullock was the lieutenant governor. He he was a Democrat. Uh, he was the comptroller for 20, 20, 25 years. And he he went to Baylor with Bogey. So he had about $3 million for a podiatry school in 95. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he told Bogey. And so Bogey went to Frank Matler, the state senator, that uh, the health science center was in his district. So he told John I he wanted a podiatry school. So I spent a year... Uh, with the head of institutional planning for UT San Antonio, putting together the academic plan for a school. Oh, no kidding. I did not know that. Yeah. So that, that uh, I have all that. Leonard Levy uh, was, helped me some in that, uh, it got him involved. And uh, Joel Baseman was the head of institutional planning. Okay. And I had no experience with budgets or anything with numbers. So I, the dean at the time was a PhD dean and he really liked me. So uh, I said, uh, Dr. Young, I said, uh, we, we need a person that has some finance experience. And you have all those special assistants over there in your office. You need to give me a special assistant that knows something about the numbers so we can get this thing done. And he gave me a guy named Don Grayton. And so we ended up putting the plan together. But what should have been, you know, three, max $4 million ended up being about 15 to $20 million. Right. They were going to build a building. They needed some research space. And we ended up with nothing. Oh. And we should have taken the money and uh, developed more residency programs. Fair enough. In, in retrospect, when I look back on that. But I, I still have that document today. No yeah, kidding. Yeah. Oh 1995, yeah, for, the, for, for, uh, for, for our school. And that's how passionate Dr. Bogey was about all of that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Right. And so I have a file on the school and I have all these letters, I mean, with the system. I was going with Bogey and all these meetings and, you know, the 80s, 90s, all of that. Right. Uh, but meeting with different people and all that. And that's where I learned the process and, you know, and the connections of the legislature and uh, and all of that, you know, in that, in that process. You know, you know, Larry, I'm reflecting on your career and, and it's really unbelievable. I mean, you're 
but it was natural, right? You could, it's kind of like you couldn't have done one thing before you did another, right? It kind of well, built upon itself. Well, I, well, I, I'm very spiritual. I, st- I feel, feel that God has a plan and a purpose for us in terms of service and what of our gifts is and understanding uh, what they are. And, and, and I basically stayed true to education. Uh, there were some times I thought about leaving and going to corporate, you know, doing stuff in corporate America to make more money and all of that. But, uh, you know, the good book said, let a man examine himself. But when I looked at my strengths and weaknesses and you know, what I was doing, it was really teaching and education. So I pretty much stayed uh, true to that. And all these things happened. It wasn't like I, you know, planned it, et cetera. So I always say that, you know, diabetes was the platform that allowed me to integrate into mainstream of medicine. And everything else was, you know, learn, serve, lead, purpose-driven, strategic plans, all of that. And then I didn't know anything about any of that in terms of business and just how things operate and, and run. And so I, I, I was open-minded. I, you know, I read a lot. Uh, and then I had met a lot of MDs along the way where you got to see what those processes are about. Now, through service, that's where I learned the most, although I was an educator. So if you're a doctor, uh, you actually are so respected that you basically have instant credibility. Uh, within the community and all that, they really uh, look up to you and and all of that. But um, I was in Leadership San Antonio in '81, and that's when I realized that there were barriers to communication, and I learned that uh, ambiguity of expectation and lack of memory are the two reasons everything fail. Yeah. Uh, people don't know what's expected, and if they don't do. Uh, that uh, they don't they forget what they're supposed to do if, if you don't have a you know a plan and, right. and it's not written written down you forget you don't remember yeah 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 you know so you can and, and that's just communication and so uh and then if you have energy and passion and you have that too jeff and that's genuine uh i mean that's those are God, gifts that that we just have you know and everybody get different gifts and all of that and a lot of people don't go unwrap them in the right way and to see the bigger picture of how how things uh, how things evolve, and um, and and I'm a white guy, and I've always kind of wanted wanted to know. Now, the service part was, I guess, growing up watching my grandmother, you know, dad, all of them doing what they were doing. But through through church, my mother grandmother was a mother usher, and she would she went all over the state. Man, she ride the bus and. You know, obviously that's amazing what what Big Mama was was doing. <laughs> I mean, and I'm sure that had, you know you, you got to see all of that and what the possibilities were. And uh, I, I I always read a lot in geography. I was a great geography student. And, you know, I reached out said I I want to go see that. I like to go there. And pretty much over my career, I I pretty much been everywhere and seen it and and participated. But again, but but it was diabetes and service that etc. But the most important thing is the connections of understanding the the uh, power of connection and uh, how to get things done. And so I I boiled that down into two words: emotion and influence. And so uh, everybody's influencing everybody else about something. Uh, you know what they want to do, whatever, and so uh, to to teach people that is is mentoring, really. That's all that is, and and if you take the time to do that and do it genuinely, you know, people you know remember and they pay attention. So any student that came, uh, I told uh, um, every person that was over externs, you know, nobody wanted that job, but if I asked them to do that, I told them that's the most important job here in this whole institution. Be, uh, of, of of podiatric medicine and surgery is is students because if we don't get good students rotating, we're not going to have excellent residents. Right. Yeah, and so we got to uh, treat them with love and respect and and just do all do things to our best where they get to see us working together in a team, and then they they may want to come and train with us. You know, you, they 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 can go anywhere they want to go, but if they see little things and you know we ain't getting along, you know, just a least little thing, they may go elsewhere. And I always told them that I wanted to win the Super Bowl of podiatry. <laughs> I like that. I like that. You know, so Larry, when, when I think about your career, I think of communication and I think mm-hmm. of leadership. And when I think of leadership, I think of doing the right thing as yeah. opposed to managing yeah. where you do things right. And yeah. uh, on behalf of our entire profession, Larry, thank you for all you've done. You're truly, truly an icon in our profession. Well, well, well Jeff, for you to say that, I'm, 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 I'm honored. But uh, I guess I would close with saying that, you know, it's, it, it, again, I wasn't 
you know, seeking that. It was just service and and uh, and doing things. And and I, I think I said, when you teach, you touch eternity. I, the students don't don't ever forget that you you know took a few minutes to to talk to them to uh, to care. Yeah, and and and, and 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 a big picture. But I think the best is yet to come for our profession. And I think the future is is in the medicine side, preparing people for full time careers in 165 MD medical schools and 45 osteopathic. I think is about how many it is now. Uh, where you got full time people there doing that every day, integrating in, interprofessionally in those uh, curriculums. Absolutely. You know as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Larry, I'm with you. Um, you know, we're running a little short on time. Again, okay. I want to thank you. Um, for all of our listeners, uh, what a great opportunity. Three episodes with Dr. Larry Harkless. Larry, I, I, I've listened to the first episode like five times already. It was outstanding. And uh, if, you're really? li- okay. if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please give us a five-star rating. And if you're on YouTube, please become a subscriber. Larry, uh, speaking for the entire profession, we're so grateful. Sending you your cup. I'm going to send you three of them, right? For three episodes. Cheers, Larry. Okay. <laughs> okay thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks. I enjoyed All it, right. Joe. Bye-bye now. Thank you for who you are and what you're doing as well. Oh, it's appreciated. Appreciate it, Larry. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye now. Bye-bye.